like to start by acknowledging my co-authors and also thanking Ian and Elizabeth for organizing this symposium and for inviting me to speak. While the goal of this symposium is to celebrate the research legacy from Gombe, I was invited to present a comparative talk to help contextualize how that research has inspired research at other sites. I'm one of the co-directors of the Kibale Chimpanzee Project. We study the Kanyawara community of chimpanzees in the Kibale National Park of Uganda. Our project is now nearing its 35th year of continuous study of these chimpanzees. Um, and I'm proud to say that we're frequent collaborators with the Gombe team. We share a lot of similarities in our methods and in our research interests. As I was putting this talk together, it occurred to me that it's almost 20 years to the day that I was able to conduct a small part of my dissertation research at Gombe. And the real highlight of my trip was getting to meet the chimpanzee Fifi. Fifi, I believe, still holds the record for the most successful chimpanzee mother. She gave birth to nine infants. Most of them survived, and most were quite successful themselves. At Kanyawara, we have a somewhat similar story of a matriarch named Utamba, who gave birth to seven offspring. Her only son is currently our alpha male, and she has uh, three adult daughters who stayed to breed in Kanyawara, which is quite unusual there. So like the F family at Gombe, the O family at Kanyawara has had an outsized impact on the structure of the community. Throughout my career, I've been really interested in the challenges that chimpanzee females face as they attempt to breed and successfully raise offspring in the wild. And when we talk about these challenges, obviously the, one of the biggest ones is for females to feed their offspring. Um, this statement that lactation is the costliest part of reproduction is absolutely true. I'm not going to challenge that today, but I do think that it's a bit of an oversimplification of what happens in any particular primate species. There's a lot of diversity in how this works, but it's an important premise because it, it makes a number of predictions. First, we expect that lactating females will change their activities either to obtain more calories or to conserve calories. Second, lactating females are expected to experience heightened energetic trade-offs and that these should be associated with some kind of negative health consequences. And finally, females who've given birth many times should be expected to suffer maternal depletion effects as they get older. We can see clear evidence of these costs in various monkeys. So for example, in Ambicelli baboons, uh, females show precipitous declines in their physical condition throughout the period of lactation, which is the first frame of this graph. This team has also shown that these lactating females exhibit slower wound healing, which is indicative of trade-offs with immune function. In rhesus macaques at Cayo Santiago, females are about twice as likely to die during the birth season when they're nursing young infants than they are during the mating season and males show the opposite pattern. We expect that great apes should have relatively high costs for primates, given the large size of the infants, the large size of their infant brains, and the much prolonged period of development. But how many extra calories do females actually have to come up with? Uh, most of you are probably thinking it's around 50%, right? I've heard that number before. This is the figure that appears most often throughout the literature. You've probably taught it to your students. I certainly have. Um, the source of this information is really difficult to track down, so I'll save you the time. It's almost completely made up. The main source for this figure of 50% over mother's costs comes from a nutrition manual for feeding rhesus macaques. It just guesstimates that you should feed lactating moms 50% more than non-pregnant, non-lactating moms. Some papers also cite one study of Ambicelli baboons that backs that figure up, but it's actually contradicted by another study from Ambicelli published just a year later. And other estimates I can find, which are based either on increases in caloric intake or on metabolic studies, suggest that the true figure for most catarine primates is about half of that. Now, there's no direct data on this for chimpanzees, but based on some of Herman Ponser's metabolic data for apes and the expected body mass of their infants at the, the P 
peak when they're intensely breastfeeding, you get something pretty close to what's shown here for orangutans, maxing out at about 25% over mother's costs. Now that's nothing to sneeze at, but it makes a lot more sense that females could manage to achieve that amount versus 50%. But where do they get these extra calories? For chimpanzees, it's not at all clear. At Gombe, uh, Carson Murray reported uh, on feeding and travel budgets, and she found that lactating females didn't spend any more time feeding or any less time traveling than non-pregnant, non-lactating females. On the other hand, during pregnancy, females were both less active and fed less. Now, they did find that lactating mothers were more likely to eat fruit, so it was 62% of the diet as opposed to 57% for non-pregnant, non-lactating females. There is a more recent study from Gombe just this year reporting similar findings that lactating females didn't adjust their activity budgets, though they did spend less time in social groups. One of my PhD students, Stephanie Fox, has been analyzing the long-term data on activity budgets at Kanyawara, and these show ex essentially the same thing. Nursing mothers do not spend more of their time feeding, nor do they differ in resting or in traveling. We also considered whether they might have a longer active period so that the percentage of time spent feeding actually amounted to a longer duration, but that wasn't the case. Now, activity budgets certainly don't tell the whole story about caloric intake or energy expenditure, but it's quite striking that female chimpanzees can nurse their infants without making major changes to their day-to-day -day activities. And so this could indicate that they're taking the energy out of themselves. Regardless of how many calories lactating mothers need, we might instead think about the high cost of nursing in terms of its long overall duration. At Gombe, infants suckled for an average of 4.7 years. At Kanyawara, we find almost exactly the same, 4.8 years. But there's plenty of evidence that females are not paying these high costs throughout that whole period Infant chimpanzees began eating solid foods at about the same age as most monkeys at around six or eight months. Studies from Gombe and Thai have documented that suckling rates sharply decrease between about a year and two years postpartum. And these data are backed up by a study of Kibali chimpanzees from Ngogo, shown here, where by two years, infants only show a very faint isotopic signature of milk consumption. Even more compelling is what's happening with the energy balance of these mothers. See, peptide profiles of nursing mothers show that they have low energy balance during the period of exclusive nursing, up to about six months, but then their energy balance begins to increase. Now, this contrasts completely with the pattern that we saw from baboons, where maternal condition worsens as infants grow and have higher energy requirements. We've also looked at an estimator of lean body mass based on urinary creatinine. And here we see almost the same pattern. Mothers are building rather than losing condition even during early lactation. And there's a distinct inflection point here at about two years where females really start to rebound. So both of these data sets also tell us that females often take two or more years after this to fully recover uh, their condition and that their ability to attain a positive energy balance is uh, what constrains their ability to reproduce again. If we compare across primates, chimpanzees along with orangutans are notable for how widely their births are spaced based on uh, the expected pattern from both non-human primates and natural fertility human populations. So if we put all these data together, they tell us an interesting story. The cost of producing infants clearly takes a hit on females that takes them years to recover from, but the costliest part of lactation seems to be really short-lived and prolonged birth spacing uh, is more likely to be a buffer both for the mothers and for their infants to help ensure that females are prepared to sustain these costs again. So, in contrast to what we've seen for other primates and what's been documented in various mammals, we're finding very little evidence that lactating females suffer health consequences. 
So for example, we found no increase in respiratory illness among females that were nursing infants under two years of age. And while females generally had higher rates of illness as they aged, it was actually the older non-nursing mothers, shown in orange here, who were sick the most. In a recent study, we looked at over 20 years of urinary cortisol data from Kanyawara, and we found that lactating mothers produce significantly lower levels of cortisol than cycling females. And contrary to the prediction of the maternal depletion hypothesis, the physiological stress associated with lactation increased less with age than that associated with cycling. We've also looked at fecal parasite loads. We found high parasite richness in uh, pregnant females, but not in females nursing young infants. We did find that lactating females had a high intensity of infection with a particularly prevalent species, esophagostomum, which is a nodule worm. Uh, but if you look at this graph, you can see a really interesting pattern. Uh, parasite levels increase dramatically throughout pregnancy when females are immunosuppressed. We then see a little bit more of an increase during the six months um, postpartum, and then levels decline sharply. So this is a time when we expect females to be experiencing the strongest energetic trade-off uh, with the immune system. And yet what they seem to be doing is actively fighting back and clearing the infections that they acquired during pregnancy. Finally, if we look at mortality, lactating mothers at Kanyawara died at about half the rate that we would expect them to based on the proportion of their adult life that they spend in that stage. Meanwhile, cycling females were five times more likely to die than we expected. This accumulated research from Gombe and Kanyawara show that female chimpanzees do take a substantial energetic hit while they're nursing their infants. It takes them years to recover. However, we've probably tended to overestimate these costs, and the costly stage is relatively brief, and it doesn't appear to significantly impact either activity or health under typical conditions. This would likely change under conditions of high resource stress. Female reproductive strategies in the great apes seem to be super conservative, and, and this seems to protect against maternal depletion. Females are only investing in new pregnancies, new reproduction, when they're in good enough condition to accept the costs that are to come. And this, in the long run, helps uh, uh, protect them and maintain long lifespans. Now, Mike Gerben has made essentially the same conclusion, having studied these questions in the Chimani horticulturalists in Bolivia, where even with very limited resources and high rates of disease, women experience only transient energetic costs of nursing their infants, and high fertility is actually associated with better rather than worse health. A final important thing to consider is that the cost of lactation are all relative. Um, and I think we have plenty of evidence to suggest that cycling female chimpanzees are experiencing all kinds of forging and social stress. Uh, so in comparison, lactation may be a time of relative luxury for a female chimpanzee. Thanks for listening. Um, I'd like to particularly acknowledge all the Ugandan field staff and field directors for all the hard work that they put into our research over the past 35 years.